Excellencies and Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests and Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. I'm Fatima, currently working as a research assistant here at BIPS. Today, I welcome you all to the BIPS Roundtable on Role <coughs> of Japan in South Asia. The moderator for today's roundtable is Major General Ene Muniru Zaman, President BIPS. For the opening remarks for today's roundtable, we have His Excellency Iwama Kiminori, Ambassador of the Embassy of Japan in Bangladesh. And the speakers for today's roundtable are Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chowdhury, Distinguished Fellow, BIPS, Dr. Lailfer Yasmin, Professor and Chairperson, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Now, I would like to request the moderator to carry on with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. And very warm welcome to everybody attending the roundtable today. Ambassador Iowa Kirimori, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. We are here to meet on a topic on a very important subject that is being talked about today is on the role of Japan in South Asia. Japan has been in South Asia and Asia for many, many years, but what is significant today that Japan is also diversifying from its economic role in South Asia to other spheres of influence and engagement from economic partnership to strategic partnership. And we are here to discuss many of these issues in the subsequent discussions that we'll have today. But we shall now start with a opening remarks by the Ambassador of Japan in Bangladesh. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Major General uh, ANN. Uh, Munir Zaman, uh, President, Bangladesh Institute of uh, Peace and Security Studies, BIPSS, Dr. Iftikhar uh, Ift Ahmed Chaudhry, uh, distinct, uh, Distinguished Fellow, BIPSS, and uh, former Advisor, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, Dr. Uh, Lail Fah Yasmin, Professor and Chair, the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It gives, me the, it gives me a great pleasure to be present at the round table on the role of Japan in South Asia, hosted by BIPSS. Dynamism created by the confluence of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is an engine of, an, of the economic growth of the entire world. The center of gravity of the world economy is shifting towards the Himal Himalayas, South, South Asia, should seize the momentum and enjoy more economic prosperity. In this context, Bangladesh is a vital country in geopolitical terms, as it is an intersection between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Bangladesh has shown its economic resilience even during the corona pandemic. Corona pandemic. Its GDP grew uh, GDP grew by almost 7% in the last fiscal years. Without a doubt, Bangladesh will be the fastest growing economy in Asia in this decade. Japan views the development of Bangladesh as significant not only to Bangladesh itself, but also to the overall stability and prosperity in South Asia and region and beyond. Last year, as you may know, Japan and Bangladesh celebrated the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. The relationship of the two countries has made significant progress for the last 50 years. Investment has greatly increased and regional connectivity has been enhanced as part of the initiative of so-called Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt, Big B which aims to help Bangladesh set up its industrial corridor and economic infrastructure in the country. For example, Dhaka Metro Line 6 and the Bangladesh Special Economic Zone, BSEZ in Arai Hajar, launched in their operation in December last year. 
The pre-opening of Dhaka International Airport Terminal 3 is scheduled this year. Development of Matabari Deep Sea Port, which will complement the function of Jitagon Port and expand business activities in the entire region, is also underway. These infrastructure projects are the typical example of Japan's pra practical cooperation to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific so-called FOIP. Japan aims to develop a free and open Indo-Pacific region through ensuring a rule-based international order in order to bring peace, stability, and prosperity to every country in the region. In this regard, Japan has been promoting a variety of practical, practical cooperation, including quality infrastructure development with Bangladesh and other countries, which is one of the key elements to realize FOIP. In March of this year, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio visited India and held Japan-India summit meeting with Indian Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi. During his visit to India, Prime Minister Kishida delivered a policy speech and announced Japan's new plan for FOIP. In this new plan, he launched the four pillars of cooperation for FOIP. One, principle for peace and rules, uh, peace and rules for prosperity. Two, addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way. Three, multi-layered connectivity. And fourth, extending efforts for security and safe use of the sea to the air. In this regard, Prime Minister Kishida also explained his announcement of this new plan for FOIP to Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hashina at the Japan-Bangladesh Summit meeting, which was held during her official visit to Japan last month. The two leaders agreed to further strengthen the bilateral relations in a wide range of areas based on the new plan for FOIP. As one of the initiatives based on the third pillar of the new plan for FOIP, that is multi-layer connectivity, Japan focuses on the development of an industrial value chain connecting the Bay of Bengal and northeastern region of India and emphasizes the importance of further strengthening connectivity in the Bay of Bengal region. As I mentioned earlier, Japan supports the development of Matabari Deep Sea Port and the connection among this port, Chittagong and Dhaka, under the initiative of Big B. I hope that this development in Bangladesh will be effectively connected with northeastern region of India and create a significant synergetic effort, uh, effect in the region in enhancing its connectivity. Also, in accordance with the fourth pillar of the new plan for FOIP, that is, extending efforts for security and safe use of the sea to the air, Japan will further promote cooperation with Bangladesh in new areas, such as transfer of defense equipment and technology from Japan to Bangladesh, and promotion of defense exchanges and goodwill exercises. In this regard, it is welcome that two vessels of Japan Maritime Self-Defense uh, Force made the, their fourth port visit to Chittagong uh, last month. Following the calls in 2012, 2019, and 2022, these visits will deepen our friendship uh, with Bangladesh Navy through various activities such as goodwill exercise and contribute to a maintaining maritime security and safety in this region. Moreover, as one of the initiatives based on the fourth pillar of the new plan for FOIP, Japan established a new cooperation framework called Official Security Assistance, OSA, for the benefit of armed forces and other related organizations of other countries. Japan will provide equipment and supplies as well as assistance for infrastructure development to friendly countries with, with, with a view to strengthen their security capacities and improving their deterrence capacities and capabilities. Bangladesh is one of the candidate countries in the first year of OSA. Taking into account its needs, Japan will cooperate with Bangladesh in OSA with a view to providing assistance that, that will contribute to strengthening security in the Bay of Bengal. These are just a few examples of the practical cooperation that Japan and Bangladesh are engaged with each other in order to realize the vision of FOIP. I believe that 
that these efforts by Japan and Bangladesh will contribute to peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region, including the South Asian countries, and lead to realization of VoIP. Japan and Bangladesh have started a new voyage towards the next 50 years of our bilateral relations. In this milestone year, I am very pleased that our relationship has been elevated from a comprehensive partnership to a strategic partnership so that Japan and Bangladesh can start our bilateral cooperation in new areas beyond the traditional areas. Last but not least, I would like to mention that the new plan for FOIP Focuses, focuses on strengthening relationship, uh, relations with countries, so-called Global South. Prime Minister Kishida said in, in his speech in India and that the so-called Global South grows and grows and the world becomes more diverse. We need to have a good understanding of our historical and cultural background and that the means of sharing responsibilities for global governance has become an increasingly important issue. From this perspective, Japan, as the G7 presidency, invited the leaders of the, the Global South, including India, to the G7 Hiroshima summit, which is being held from May 19th to 21st today, 2023, and had a discussion with these leaders on how the G7 and the Global South could work together to solve the challenges they have been facing in the current international, international situations. I sincerely hope that these bilateral and multilateral efforts will strengthen relations between Japan and South Asia, including Bangladesh, and contribute to peace, stability, and prosperity for the entire region. I also hope that the roundtable will deepen our understanding on the role of Japan in South Asia and the way forward for us in the future. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you for your remarks, and I hope towards the end, the Ambassador will also be happy to take some questions if you have. But we shall now start with the panelists to discuss and give their own remarks. But it's significant to say that we are discussing this at a time when the bilateral relationship between Japan and Bangladesh has been elevated to strategic partnership level, from comprehensive partnership to strategic partnership is a big leap forward. And we hope that the new partnership level that has been elevated will bring new benefits to Bangladesh. During the recent visit of Prime Minister Asina to Tokyo, a number of issues were discussed. As a security think tank, an issue of particular interest to us is the defense agreement, which is part of the statement that has been issued after her visit in Tokyo. We also notice with interest that Japan is going through a new phase of its security planning. And in December 16, last year, Prime Minister Kishida announced that Japan government has approved three new plans. They are the National Security Strategy, or NSS, the National Defense Strategy, and the Defense Forces Plan. Under this, for the first time, Japan will also acquire the capacity for counter-strike when it needs. This is a significant leap forward and a change. And it is also noteworthy to mention that Japan has now decided to spend 2% of its GDP for its defense capabilities, which is a massive jump from its previous capacity because Japan will spend something like 315 billion US dollars over the next five years and 2% of his GDP. So in terms of Japan's strategic posture, we see a major change, not only as a quad member, a country that had practically initiated the concept of quad. It is Prime Minister Abe who first thought about the concept of quad during a visit to New Delhi and then the Quad came into the formation. So it is not only an economic player in the region, Japan is now becoming a major strategic player in the region. It will also play its rightful role under the new vision of Prime Minister Kishida 
in his defense capabilities. So discuss this and many more. We shall now go back to our panelists, and I have the pleasure to invite our first member of the panel, Dr. Iftakar Ahmed Chaudhary, a distinguished fellow at BIPS and a former foreign minister of Bangladesh. Dr. Chaudhary, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Can we have the microphone? Microphone here? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, applaudits are owed to Ambassador Kiminori for his excellent and succinct uh, expose on Bangladesh-Japan relations, uh, always uh, solid and sustained, and once again coming to the fore with the visit of uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina there. In my remarks, I'll take the cue from you, uh, Chairman, and, and talk about how the world looks at Japan, and Japan looks at the world, Japan's worldview. Uh, or, I mean, culled from my own experience and exposure to Japan and also my many years at the National University of Singapore, from which perch I was able to watch Japan uh, from uh, closer proximity. Uh, I recognize Ambassador Dola, uh, who was uh, a very active envoy uh, when I visited Japan in February 2008. Uh, I had the honor of being hosted by Foreign Minister uh, Mashiko Kimura, but I recall uh, uh, Ambassador Daula had gathered a glittery tie of Japanese uh, political players, uh, uh, Messrs. Taro Aso, uh, uh, Toshio Takano, uh, uh, Messrs. Nishikawa, uh, and, and the like. And, uh, you know, I acknowledge uh, that with, uh, with, with gratitude. Uh, Japan's worldview, uh, as with its perceptions of most phenomena, uh, has been sober, subtle, and sophisticated. This circumspection, carefulness, shaped its foreign policy and diplomacy because in the post-World War II era, it needed to be low-key. A merchant and maritime state, it was constrained by lack of natural resources and often self-imposed necessary military restraints symbolized in the Constitution's Article 9. Relative peace combined with domestic stability and external, particularly U.S., security guarantees, allowed its creative energies to find fruition in its technological advance. It made Japan the regional leader in what the economist Kawame Akamatsu in the 1960s called the flying geese paradigm, Oganko Keitai Ron. This pertains to the flight of a flock of geese with one bird in the lead, inspiring the others to follow. Uh, you see, um, this brought enormous prosperity to Japan, which then needed protection for its sustainability. This also implied the need for a positive global perception of Japan, combined with Japan's larger benevolent international footprint. A natural consequence was its conduct of omnidirectional diplomacy for decades. It was given substance in the 1970s by Prime Minister Takeo Fukuda when he launched his all-directional foreign policy uh, uh, for peace, uh, also called Fukuda Doctrine. It eased relations with China, fostered links with ASEAN countries, and created ties with Australia. The Nixon-Kissinger Initiative led the U.S. draw Japan, uh, China deeper into the web of multilateralism, which gave Japan some needed welcome respite. Japan also reached out to the developing world of the global south with heavy doses of diplomacy combined with generous development assistance, including to South Asia. Bangladesh was a major beneficiary. Japan's burgeoning popularity across the world engendered a desire within itself for a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. So, Japan needed to be globally perceived as 
pro proactive, positive, and a predictable state actor. But nothing remains constant in global politics, uh, uh, and global politics too are in perennial flux. China grew stronger and was being perceived as increasingly more assertive with, with the application of President Xi Jinping's uh, Xiao Guomang or China Dream. Its relations with Japan's strongest ally, the United States, began to wane. In the two, uh, 2010s, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe sought to continue with panoramic diplomacy covering the world, covering the world, which became known as the Abe Doctrine. It required certain adjustments to Japan's external behavior. The realities of the regional global impact on China's rise needed policy recalibrations in Tokyo. As a result, geostrategic and normative elements were incorporated into Japan's foreign policy. No great surprise, therefore, when in August 2016, Prime Minister Abe launched the concept, uh, 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 launched the concept of free and open Indo-Pacific. The key tool with which he wished to achieve it was the quadrilateral cooperation uh, between Australia, India, Japan, and the United States, better known as the Quad. Three prongs comprised Abe administration's democratic security diamond. One, the buttressing of defense under the policy called proactive contribution to peace, the strengthening of the Quad by giving the concept more content, and three, an expanding and development finance role also seen to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative. Fast forward to the present. The current Prime Minister Fumio Kishida came into office after a brief one year of governance by PM Yoshihide Tsuga. PM Tsuga had largely continued his predecessor's foreign policy. He stepped aside following a multiplicity of challenges arising from the COVID pandemic, economic stagnation, and rising security threats. PM Kishida then had served as foreign minister during the Abe years. Even during that period, he was viewed by his own admission as more liberal and dovish than his leader within the ruling uh, Liberal Democratic Party. Indeed, he had led the LDP's Kochikai faction, which is the broad bond security, fund, uh, founded by Hayato Ikeda in 1957, which had underscored the importance of Sino-Japanese relations as also multilateral approaches to for regional challenges. Coming as he does from Hiroshima, and Hiroshima, as you know, hosted the G7. That was the symbolic, uh, and this, you understand the symbolism associated with it, the city that had experienced uh, the atomic bomb devastations. PM Kishida was an unlikely champion of higher military spending, but he needed to shed his moderate credentials to some degree while contesting for leadership his rival, the clearly right-wing Sinai Takaichi, the latter, Mr. Takaichi advocated revising the Pacific Article 9 and nearly doubling the defense budget. This perhaps, perhaps imposed upon PM Kishida more hardened postures than would have been otherwise expected. Clearly, he needed to address the anxiety emanating from tensions regarding Taiwan and the perceived threats from China on the East and South China Seas, the relentless North Korean missile and munition tests, and the issues arising out of disputes on intellectual property with Beijing. The uh, situation enhanced the scope for what is called the Thucydides trap, the possibility of war through miscalculations. And as you know, the famous Greek philosopher, historian Thucydides had said, when Athens grew strong, there was great fear in Sparta and war was inevitable. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of his ter term, uh, uh, he articulated a three-pronged foreign policy. It heralded more continuity than change from the Abe Suga approach. Policies 
uh, continued to be value-laden. Now, this is important. To synchronize with Western allies on the matrix of contest with China on the Pacific and the growing conflict with Russia in Europe. The three priorities were first, the determination to fully defend the universal values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, and to, quotes, vigorously promote a free and open Indo-Pacific, end quote. Making use of Quad allies and the like-minded countries. They included friends from South Asia and Southeast Asia, including the ASEAN nations. A clear indication that he would not want to be seen as soft on China was his appointment of the former conservative defense minister, Mr. Nakatani, who was outspoken on Hong Kong and Xinjiang issues as, as human rights advisor. Second was to maximally ensure protection for Japan, of Japan. He did so by emphasizing the US links, declaring North Korean missile tests as totally unacceptable, and by willing to meet the South Korean leadership without preconditions. And third, addressing the wider global issues as nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, climate change, and a new Japanese form of uh, capitalism, which he believed would bring more equitable growth and redistribution through expanded free trade. The application of these thoughts is eventually named realism diplomacy for a new era. His, its value-laden component was deepened following the Ukraine conflict and PM Abe's policy of negotiating with President Vladimir Putin over territories was halted. On the one hand, while there was a useful meeting of the two foreign ministers, on the other, on the other hand, PM Kishida did not receive the departing Chinese ambassador for his farewell call. Significantly, though, this is the 45th anniversary year of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship between China, Japan and China. Hence, some, some incremental enhancement of interaction is a logical possibility. With South Korea, given the unacceptability of North's missile tests, the so-called shuttle diplomacy was back, back on track. The ASEAN nations, and I was able to follow this with interest from Singapore, while welcoming Japan's robust regional counterweight to China, were cherry of the kind of swing in Japan's policy that would necessitate them, that is the ASEAN states, to take sides. Their, now this is important, their acceptance of the term Indo-Pacific, the acceptance by the ASEAN nations of the term Indo-Pacific, which is more politically loaded, was a tad hesitant Tad hesitant in place of the apolitical and merely geographical expression Asia Pacific. The Kishida administration is likely to continue efforts to get the three uh, recalcitrant uh, ASEAN states, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand, into the Progressive Agreement for Trans Transpacific Partnership, or CPTPP. In South Asia, for Japan, relations with India, as you have heard, remains key. Bangladesh also became a link in this claim. It was largely because the Kishida administration wanted to take forward the August 2017 agreement establishing the Japan-India Cooperation Forum, or JICF. It aimed at developing India's northeast. Some strategic projects were being contemplated across a spectrum of connectivity, roads, infrastructures, etc. The Japanese financing of the Matabari Deep Sea Project is said to be linked to it. In addition, there is the idea of the Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt, or Big B in Japan. The projects under it, mainly the Dhaka MRT line, the Matabari Deep Sea Port, Dhaka Airport Terminal 3, and Arai Hazar Economic Zone, which the ambassador had mentioned, will massively transform this country and South Asian economic uh, outlook. Yes, Japan will benefit from the market of 170 million, its growing purchasing power, its democratic dividend, and labor source. Yes, Japan will also benefit from the rapid economic transformation fueling regional change. And yes, Japan will also benefit from its friend Bangladesh evolving into a middle-income powerful player in the global economy and polity. But 
evidence points to the happy fact that this is not the only reason why Japan has been holding Bangladesh's hand since its inception in 1972. Indeed, I recall the historic visit of Takashi Hayagawa to Dhaka that laid the foundation of the relationship in March 1972. Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman undertook a mutually rewarding trip to Japan in 1973. I think it was October. Japan signaled its wish for these relations to be seen as an example of a mutually rewarding model of cooperation in which a stronger partner genuinely helps a weaker partner stand up. As a diplomat and a civil servant for my country, I have seen this spirit motivate Japan and, its inf and influence its policy, policymakers through decades. Which is why, at a private level, nothing will please many of my diplomatic peers around the world more than to see Japan as a permanent member of the Security Council. Japan is a tested system and the Japanese are a tested people. As the Japanese proverb goes, that country can fall seven times and get up eight. As a model of uh, model development cooperation partners, Japan and Bangladesh are treading a novel, almost unique path. And as the Spanish poet Antonio Machado has said, traveler, there is no path. Path is made by walking. I thank you. Dr. Chaudhary, that was an ex excellent expose of our bilateral relationship and as how Japan sees itself in the world and how the world sees Japan. Japan continues to remain an engaged friend of Bangladesh. It's our biggest development partner. It has significant contribution to Bangladesh's infrastructural ambitions, and it continues to play a significant role in peace and stability in the region and beyond. And those are the roles which are critical not only to Bangladesh, but also to all peace-loving, aspiring countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Bangladesh has just released this in the Pacific outlook, and we believe firmly in the principles of free and open in the Pacific. That is to the benefit of Bangladesh. And the recent visit of Prime Minister Asina to Tokyo has also brought about some more significant areas of cooperation. <laughs> One area that specifically needs a mention is the Matabari deep sea port and the economic zone that will be constructed there. Prime Minister Sena and Prime Minister Kishida also express their opinion for early establishment of Mohesh Kali Matarbari Integrated Infrastructure Development Initiative or MIDI. And through MIDI, Bangladesh will now evolve a master plan for development of that master plan area, which is around Mohesh Kali area. Prime Minister Kishida has also talked about a new supply chain resilience that is to build out of that concept Well, he visited New Delhi very recently. Bangladesh can also become a growth engine for development of the Indian Northeast. So there is a burgeoning relationship of a trilateral nature amongst Japan, Bangladesh, and India. And we should keep our eyes and ears open, all our windows open for the benefit of Bangladesh. Our next panelist will bring up these issues and many more, and she's aptly qualified to speak on these issues. Our good friend, Dr. Lailu Yasmin, Professor and Chair, Department of International Relations in University of Dhaka. Lailu you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Um, thank you, sir. Yeah, it's working, uh, so. Thank you, sir, and His Excellency um, and Excellencies and distinguished uh, guests here. Um, thank you, sir, for inviting me to talk about an issue that uh, I've started learning um, because um, um, 
the relationship as, as Bangladesh expands its uh, international uh, politics, international relations, and as Bangladesh keeps on taking its agenda setting role in um, different international forums, it is important for us to cultivate our bilateral relations as well as to look at them from very strategic perspective uh, connecting the region. So I'll have a number of uh, key issues on which I'd like to make some, uh, make some um, sort of uh, deliberations. First of all, um, today we are talking about Japan-South Asia relations. So why South Asia and what is the strategic importance of South Asia? Uh, South Asia uh, is a, a major region where 25% of global population lives and uh, it uh, hosts uh, two nuclear weapon states, declared nuclear weapon state. Despite that, it has always been uh, generally at the strategic backwater in international politics uh, as, uh, as early uh, or as late as even 2012-2013. Uh, 2013, foreign policy and foreign affairs journals used to uh, publish articles uh, citing whether South Asia exists. And because South Asia never uh, was able to throw its independent uh, strategic uh, importance to the rest of the world. So what is the, you know, what, what are the countries of South Asia and how they are projecting themselves? This was a big issue in international politics. Living here, it may come as a surprise, but that is how international politics or in, in international relations South Asia has always been viewed. Um, South Asia has fastest growing economies in the region. And um, um, as uh, Sar pointed out, Bangladesh's economic growth, IMF's latest uh, prediction um, argues that uh, Bangladesh's, uh, Bangladesh's uh, economic growth would be 5.5 in the coming year, which uh, uh, may sound funny, but they argued that it would be greater than China, whose uh, economic growth is predicted to be 5.2. Of course, there is no comparison between Bangladesh's economy and China's economy because of the size and because of many other issues. But the, in terms of growth project, projection, Bangladesh is going to be the fastest growing economy in, uh, uh, um, in South Asian region. So this strategic importance of South Asia has often been neglected, has often been overlooked, um, because when we have seen the major players of South Asia, especially India and Pakistan, have always looked outside of the region for receiving their, you know, a pat in the back, if I may say it that way. So they have seldom looked at building the region, building the political region. So South Asia itself has been quite catatonic and quite indecisive in terms of uh, creation of a uh, institutional political and regional bondage and among many other uh, you know other uh, regional initiatives in different parts of the world south asia has the least integrated economy where only 5.5 percent uh, you know uh, bilateral trades or regional trade happens in the region so south asia has already it's uh, some of the issues which uh, um, I'll, I'll argue later uh, that is where japan comes to play uh, second point uh, something for which south asia has come to uh, international note notice is connectivity. The idea of connectivity has been discussed much earlier, but because of Cold War, because of a number of strategic sort of uh, backlog or strategic sort of, you know, hesitation, we have not seen the ideas of connectivity taking uh, uh, taking forward. Uh, Parak Khanna, uh, a famous writer, was, fir was first to point out uh, in a very cogent manner about connectivity, and he argued uh, that connectivity is going to be the arms race of uh, 21st century. Not only uh, Porakanda, but uh, Jeff Malgan in his book Connect City in 1997 argued that, you know, the world is not in its weapon system, but the nature of connectivity in humans beyond borders. So it is important how people are, uh, you know, connected, how cities are being built, what are the key cities inside a country, what are the key areas, and how they are connected with the, with the in, in the regional context. So uh, Saskia Sassen is another scholar who argued much earlier that we need smarter cities. Uh, instead of you know looking at uh, the concept of you know state as the only provider of uh, benefits and welfares, so we need to build cities. So the idea of connectivity, um, this was sort of uh, um, brought forward by uh, Porak Khanna and with Japan's inclusion or uh, connectivity project in uh, um, South Asia, we can see how this can be uh, taken uh, another sort of big step for uh, South Asian region. Uh, the idea of regionalism and especially as it is more pertinent in the case of Asia being a vast continent, um, this idea of uh, separating Asian, uh, you know, different parts of Asia into region itself has its origin during the Second World War, during warfare 
fighting purposes because these are not very con very um, these are arbitrary name uh, given to different regions because South Asia at one point of its political conception in 1985 thought it to itself to be belonging to seven countries. Then in 2002 we decided no, we also want Afghanistan as part of South Asia. So we can see how this has an overlapping meaning. Um, ASEAN, for example, has done a fantastic job in this regard where they have been able to create political and uh, a different kind of identity where an ASEAN mind and ASEAN way of thinking works. But in South Asia, we have not yet been able to do it. Why have we not been able to do it? Because there has been a number of contestations, number of players, uh, asymmetry in terms of uh, you know size, in, uh, in terms of population, in terms of geographic size. So this is where we can see that uh, this very uh, you know uh, uh, latest uh, effort taken up by India, Bangladesh, and Japan is, comes to uh, uh, can be considered as a very important uh, you know step forward because this is the first time that India recognizes that in uh, the region of South Asia is not only its own playground. There's a number of reasons behind this. An, an article published by written by C. Rajamohan, uh, I think April 23 or April 24, um, uh, and which argues very cogently that this is the first time uh, India had to recognize because of you know a number of players active in the region that a great game has come to Asia. A great game has come to um, South Asia. So the idea of great game was first the first coined by a British William Connolly in 1840, and then it was uh, promoted uh, by Rudyard Kipling uh, in his you know different uh, you know articulations. So, great game originally the idea was uh, connected to the mastery of Asia. It turns out it's not only the mastery of Asia; it's also mastery of South Asia. So, great game has come to South Asia. Here we can see that how um, you know the, the whole idea, or in another word, uh, history is back. So, how we can see that uh, Japan has uh, come forward as a region builder, political region builder in South Asia, where the connectivity between India, Bangladesh, and Japan would lead to inclusion of uh, two landlocked countries, Nepal and Bhutan, and uh, uh, guarantee their access to the Indo-Pacific. Now, here comes Indo-Pacific, because uh, um, um, former speaker has also spoken about Asia-Pacific versus Indo-Pacific, uh, this very idea. So we have seen there has been a fundamental change in the way we look at geopolitics or international relations in 21st century. We have gone back to, or we have you know, reintroduced it as a maritime century once again. Now we are not looking at uh, politics from land-centric perspective, but from mar maritime uh, perspective. And that is where I think that Indo-Pacific, this very term, which is a confluence of uh, in Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, is very significant for us to learn because it covers not only the littoral nation, but also so it covers, you know, world's gaze towards this region, uh, this region. So another interesting aspect of Japan's involvement in South Asia must have to be identified where Japan has taken a keen interest in looking at its relationship with global South its relationship with Global South, not in a, a you know, lateral sense or in a uh, vertical sense, but in a horizontal sense. And this has been the crux of Japan's new ODA policy and Japan's relationship with the Global South that here uh, is not only based on donor-recipient relationship, but it is also based on learning about what are the practical uh, you know significance of uh, practical si significance of uh, quote unquote recipient country and how japan can be relevant in the uh, development process of these countries therefore we can see that how and why bangladesh uh, so, uh, japan has invested in matarbari project which has far reaching consequences not only for bangladesh but also for the entire region so here we can see that it's the japan's relationship is evolving not as a aid donor, but also as a strategic partner. So far, we can see Japan has uh, made a strategic partnership, which is often known as comprehensive strategic partnership, comprehensive strategic partnership initiative, or comprehensive uh, strategic partnership agreement with Australia, UAE, Vietnam, um, uh, European Union, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, India, Malaysia. So this is just a small number and Japan is uh, talking with uh, 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 for uh, Vietnam. Um, so the Japan is talking now with ASEAN for a possible, um, you know, uh, CSP, uh, comprehensive strategic partnership. Um, so we can see that how uh, the issue of strategic partnership, comprehensive strategic partnership, not only covers 
covers the area of economic relationship, but also it takes into account of the strategic environment of the region and translate it to policy making level. Uh, then Japan South Asia uh, in Japan and South Asia relationship FDI plays an important role. We know that in terms of ODA, uh, India and Bangladesh always either of the countries always tops in terms of receiving uh, ODA from Japan. There's a historical reason behind this, and we all know this, but except for India and uh, Bangladesh, the, uh, Japan has uh, started building a robust relationship with Nepal in terms of FDI. For example, in 2022, Japan um, and uh, Nepal uh, signed an F FDI agreement where Japan is, pay, uh, Japan is going to uh, uh, pay um, Japanese yen 10 billion policy loan for economic growth and resilience uh, for uh, infrastructure purposes, which is also uh, done in uh, um, sort of in consultation and in collaboration with World Bank, which ultimately will turn into a hundred fifty million uh, dollar uh, American dollar uh, project. Also, Japan's fundamental contribution in its soft power, but this is one area I think Japan is a bit lagging behind than many other countries because whenever we are uh, going to look at the data, uh, students going to study in Japan from India, Nepal, or Bangladesh, uh, the number is quite low than uh, they are going in other countries. For example, uh, from Bangladesh um, uh, in the year 2021 to 2022, um, uh, uh, there were approximately 10,000 uh, uh, 10,600 students going to America because America is the uh, primary destination for Bangladeshi students for their higher studies. In comparison to that, uh, in Japan, under the Japanese government scholarship, there was there were only 120 students. Similar is the case for India, a little higher, around 1,500, uh, that is 1,500. Uh, for Nepal is also the number is very low, and Sri Lanka is also the number is very low. So this is one area Japan is yet to cultivate uh, its, uh, its uh, relationship, its appeal, a uh, soft power appeal um, in, in the region. As for Bangladesh, as has been already spoken by Iftikhar Sir and um, uh, General Munizuman, uh, about uh, you know how the relationship has elaborated to comprehensive strategic partnership. But we need, we should not look at look into only that part. But we need to look into what are the you know uh, uh, sort of long term benefits that we receive from uh, Japan. Uh, for example, um, in for Sri Lanka, uh, Japan donated a couple of years back uh, two ships worth what eleven million dollars uh, for uh, 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 as part of its coast. Uh, you know, development. So there are uh, potential of uh, uh, developing uh, uh, and expanding Japan-Bangladesh relationship in the strategic area and defense-related area because Bangladesh's maritime border is quite vulnerable. We already know that, and uh, you know, upcoming uh, uh, you know uh, sort of uh, years is not going to uh, be very rosy. Uh, so here we can see that. Um, how Japan-Bangladesh relationship um, has uh, taken uh, sort of um, has uh, branched out in several areas, economy being the uh, basis of that. But as we can see, as JICA RI is working actively in Bangladesh, that Japan is also making its engagement to different universities and uh, sort of uh, uh, um, sort of in, uh, sort of uh, providing its outlook, strategic outlook, and its uh, goals and objectives about a rules-based international order for which students are always interested to look into um, uh, different possibilities. So Bangladesh is a, a, a sort of a market of 170 million people with a demographic dividend of youth, uh, you know, a number of youths who are looking forward to developing their skills and contributing to different areas. So <coughs> in this context, Japan should connect, uh, and with all due respect, I don't know if any representatives of uh, private universities here, with all due respect, uh, you know, the orientation should be more invest investment, more Towards public universities, why? Because there is there are some country specific, you know, uh, country specific characteristics where you would see that it is the public university students who seek for BCS Bangladesh Civil Service, uh, you know, um, at, uh, uh, um, uh, test, and they are the ones who go into policy making. So five years, ten years down the road, it is the public university students who are going to making going to be making policies instead of you know private university students. Their destination in terms of job and uh, uh, you know their future is quite different so you 
So you have to make a choice where you are going, uh, whether to public universities or to private universities. So there are very country specific, some of the characteristics that often we forget to identify uh, and how this can have a far reaching uh, sort of um, far reaching sort of impact in bilateral relationship. So we can see that, uh, you know, as a Japan Bangladesh relationship sort of flourishes, uh, Bangladesh uh, also sort of uh, uh, takes into account of Japan's uh, consideration with regard to the region and wants to be an active partner because Bangladesh's geopolitical significance, it is, it is very difficult for us to forget that it was a, a former Japanese ambassador back in 2014 who identified linchpin position of Bangladesh at the mouth of the Bay of Bengal. And from then on, we have seen how great power, great powers have been interested to come and invest in Bangladesh and Bangladesh's uh, sort of um, uh, outward, uh, uh, sorry, uh, southward, uh, you know, access. This has provided much needed strategic depth, much needed uh, you know agenda setting capacity that Bangladesh is enjoying now Bangladesh has a long way to go of course and this cannot be done without its strategic partners and economic partners uh, sorry I end here so thank you yes thank you thank you professor for your wonderful presentation uh, I'm also happy to note that your concern about soft power expansion in Bangladesh by Japan has been addressed during the visit of Prime Minister Sina to Tokyo because there is a significant part in the agreement which addresses people-to-people -people contact. It talks about also bringing back the Japanese volunteer corps back to Bangladesh. It talks about cultural exchanges. So I think the deficiency that has been noticed by you is gradually being addressed, but at the same time, I note with concern that the level of Bangladeshi students going to Japan is extremely low. The two prime ministers did address the need to increase tourism, including sports tourism and people's tourism. But uh, I also would like to point out as a friend that to do that, you have to make the process of visas for Bangladeshi tourists going to Japan much easier. The current bureaucratic chain of getting a Japanese visa for a Bangladeshi tourist almost makes it impossible for him to travel. So those are the areas we need to address. But as I said, as a security think tank, our focus was also looking at the new building of security cooperation between Japan and Bangladesh. A significant part of the agreement that was signed in Tokyo addresses this. As the ambassador mentioned in his opening remarks, there were two ships of Japanese self-defense force that recently visited Chittagong. They talk about exchange of training visits. It talks about exchange of visits at the high level of command. It talks about exchange of defense equipment. It has other component like they have decided to establish a defense wing or defense attaches wing in our mutual embassies in Tokyo and in Dhaka. It talks about the establishment of official security assistance program by Japan. And towards the end, which I am not quite sure what it means, establishment of a new cooperation framework for the benefit of the armed forces and other related organizations of like-minded countries for the purpose of deepening security cooperation and look forward to the future cooperation under this framework. So there is a lot that is happening and we need to see them very carefully so that what we are trying to achieve matures for the benefit of, of our people. We shall now open the floor for discussion, which is the best part of the whole round table always. I welcome questions, comments from the floor. You can ask to an individual panelist or you can ask to the whole panel. And you know that we have a distinguished panel for you to respond to this. My request is please be very brief so that we can take in as many comments and questions and introduce yourself so that the ambassador knows who you are asking the question. We shall start with our former ambassador to Japan. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, General. <clears throat> it's good to see 
my uh, former senior colleague and my boss, Dr. Iftaka Choudhury, Ambassador Kimonori and uh, Professor Laila. Uh, it's a very good, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, uh, you know, uh, session. I was uh, had the honor to serve in uh, Japan as Bangladesh ambassador for four over four years, uh, from 2006 to 2010. And as uh, uh, Dr. Choudhury has mentioned, it, I had the honor of receiving him in February 2008, and uh, I hosted a reception for him, and which was attended. He has kindly uh, he knew remembers the name more than I do. Uh, you know all those uh, top uh, uh, you know Japanese politician, and that that was kind of an expression of Japanese interest on Bangladesh. A Bangladesh foreign minister is coming, and uh, you know a number of top politicians they attended, including the the prospective prime minister then. Uh, Mr. Taro also, and uh, I must I must admit, you know, what I learned in Japan about Japan and, and its role over four years, I learned it in your 12 minutes statement. Thank you. <clears throat> I, th you know, uh, let me begin uh, with what you had mentioned and really that resonated strongly among the Japanese politicians and diplomats and the subsequent to your, uh, you know. Uh, to a visit, a lot of people they asked me about this to expand it. What's this flying geese? And you know, this concept and making that formation and Japan as the head of that formation that really strongly resonated uh, in the Japanese mind. And also I think uh, it, in a way it was a statement of the fact of how Bangladesh perceives Japan's role not only in South Asia, bilaterally, but internationally. But let me put it, uh, you'll have to give me a little more time then, you know, just. <clears throat> I think we can't discuss anything in isolation without talking about the historical background. So how does, and since it is a South Asia, let me, uh, you know, share certain perspective of South Asia. The first time I think Japan came into the imagination of the South Asian region that the during uh, following the Japan Russo war, that I think had created a very positive impact in the region that Asians were not only destined to be colonized, but they can also be a powerful player internationally. So that's number one. Second, our Tagore, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tagore or uh, Rabindranath Tagore, he visited Japan in 1916 and he brought South Asian perspective into the imagination of the Japanese mind. And I think, believe he was the first, not only an intellectual connection, but also social and political connection established with, with, with Japan. And very important element that how, you know, Japan's perspective has been shaped on South Asia. The Radha Binod Paul, Justice Radha Binod Paul, although called as Indian, but he was born in Jeshore. So I, an Indian ambassador, we had argument. I say he's Bangladesh, he said, no, he's Indian. Anyway, that he was the only Understand. judge in the nine judge panel uh, in the Tokyo Understand. tribunal that who had given a dissenting judgment. So that really, and how Japan respected him, there are two things that his bust is, you know, is, is, is still, uh, uh, you know, preserved at the very famous or infamous Yasukuni uh, temple. And then in 2007, when uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visited India, he also visited Calcutta to talk to the, you know, descendants of Justice Radhavino Paul. And then we had our Netaji Shivas Bosch, who went to you know Japan, you know seek, seeking Japan's assistance. So you can feel the very emotional uh, attachment to South Asia. Also, in 1951, during the San Francisco Peace Treaty Agreement, the Sri Lankan, the then Finance Minister, later the President, Dr. Javardane, he had only he was the only voice with the same voice who said at that time, although a developing country, third world country, that Japan should be reintegrated 
with the international world and the world should not punish japan with the harsh treatment of war reparation or the thing and that was a really a very very great voice so i think as japan uh, uh, dr choudhury has said that it started very subtle generous and benevolent uh, in a way it also wanted to reciprocate the sentiments of the south asian so slowly i think that is the genesis that is the basis that japan had started providing uh, you know the financial assistance but that the but mind it a country which was completely devastated completely devastated not only the by nuclear war i was there and i see mentally physically emotionally economically that within 10 years of his uh, you know of his loss in the war became a very net provider donor countries in the world Thank not you. only in south asia reaching out to the latin america africa so i think japan had tried to connect two things that to reestablish its image positive image and two that that it wanted to reach out to the people to the world to the global south south so you know global south with its soft power <clears throat> japan's uh, Can, uh, you know, can we uh, finish quickly, please? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. 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 Okay. The other was. Okay. Fighting. All right. Okay. This Shinzo Abe's, you know, two thousand seven, when he uh, addressed the Japanese Parliament or statement, he said, "Confluence is up to two seeds." I think that was the seed planted for this today's Quad and Indo-Pacific, and and uh, you know so. i think the present uh, uh, prime minister kishida prime minister kishida as dr uh, uh, choudhury said he is following that in the footstep of uh, prime minister shinzo abe and very rightly so very rightly so that we see a, a new strategy of japan that japan is militarily uh, you know defense wise japan is creating its capability uh, japan is creating it its strength very rightly reason japan feels very nervous in the region that it it looks uh, you know it is there so i think that's what it but one thing that our panels did not mention is the rohingya issue they when come, it comes come to, to japan to. bangladesh i think rohingya issue is the one of the most important issue we do not want a gaza in bangladesh thank you i hope people will understand what i mean by gaza thank you very much Thank you, Ambassador. And you rightly mentioned that it is Prime Minister Abe who first thought of the concept of Quad, and he was speaking in India when he talked about the confluence of the seas. But I would also like to just remind you, very interestingly, when he talked about the concept of the confluence of seas, he basically referred to a book written by a Bugal prince called Dara Shiko. the concept of confluence of seas came from that book and he referred to that book when he brought about the concept of confluence and eventually the quad colonel you have the floor next uh, thank you just to uh, introduce myself uh, my name is uh, lieutenant colonel uh, crawford mcclellan simply known as colonel mac uh, firstly i have uh, something in common uh, with the president and the moderator uh, we are both alumni from national defense uh, college my question is in general but specifically to the, the japanese ambassador leading on from significant conflicts russo japanese war as one and several established rules on theory of power in south asia and wider indo pacific perspective how relevant are mckinder's heartland alfred mann's sea power theory and speakman's rimland theory in today's contested indo pacific and japan's role thank you thank you so you have the floor microphone here please thank you thank you mr chair and i wanted to 
start by by congratulating the ambassador for his very ins insightful opening remarks and also the the panel for enlightening us on issues uh, that are very relevant relevant to us so I basically uh, in the interest of time I'd be very short I have three main main comments firstly uh, on the emerging uh, policies of Japan and you know, of shifting away from the former pacifist foreign policy to a, to a almost uh, sort of confrontational or uh, defense oriented foreign policy i think uh, this is uh, something uh, for us uh, to wait and see how it emerges uh, i was part of the honorable prime minister sheikh hasina's entries to japan uh, back in 2019 when uh, prime minister shinzo abe had hosted her i think that time still we were uh, seeing japan while discharging its traditional rule but indicating that in the days to come it might take up a lot of other 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 directions um, matarbari was definitely a, a, a important uh, iconic intervention that japan had I, in my capacity as the principal secretary i was very much involved in the in the formulation and development process uh, ambassador my first point is matarbari requires a very good communication strategy uh, because it is a very benevolent approach coming from japan but uh, sometimes different quarters uh, they they try to distort the whole philosophy purpose and objective of of matarbari project so i'm i'm very very supportive of the of the project i personally feel this will de definitely not only serve the interest of uh, bangladesh but also other land landlocked countries to to in indian uh, seven sisters this is one secondly i think something ambassador asafuddullah has already uh, alluded to is while you were focusing on 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 south asia is 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 there in any way japan is shying away from the persistent problem that bangladesh has with its other neighbor myanmar i was in myanmar uh, for a couple of years and i've, I've seen that the 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 problem uh, rohingya problem in particular is becoming very repetitive i i was handling the second wave of refugees coming into bangladesh but during our our student time we were uh, learning about the first wave of refugees now we have many waves coming now so this is the this is the second question and third question would be as you know the south asia is uh, i think uh, both dr iftihar and uh, professor yasmin alluded to very well that it it's least integrated um, economy not only economy the region they say we said that when the sark was not delivering the some wise leaders they formed a sub regional approach called bbin uh, my 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 question would be to you and also to the panel how you would basically minimize the apparent contradiction between south asia in its entirety and the rise of sub regional approach uh, and how will the japanese policy be be, be fine tuned to address this so thank you thank you thank you very much mamud you have the floor <laughs> thank you chair please uh, introduce yourself uh, i am air vice marshal mamud hussain retired i am currently teaching at national aviation and aerospace university i have got two issues one for the excellency and the other for dr ifthar choudhury uh, excellency congratulations for becoming the ambassador of japan to bangladesh and uh, we are very proud that japan has been one of the leading development partners and i was the chairman civil aviation authority for some time and during that time in fact the idea of third terminal came up we brought in many experts from many different countries they said that space was less the terminal building would not be in fact uh, constructed here it was the japanese designers who said that it was possible 
And today we see that the third terminal for Hazrat Shah Jalal International Airport will be soon inaugurated by the end of this year. Uh, congratulations for that. And we should all feel proud for this. Excellency, uh, as you say that the number of students going to Japan from Bangladesh is less far and few between. Uh, the university that I teach at, it is about aerospace. And after you took over the office, in fact, the vice chancellor also wrote a letter to you congratulating you, whether you have seen that letter or not. And we also sought some kind of support from you in terms of exchange programs of faculty and other courses to be developed with your help. I think this is the right forum for me to also bring, bring up that matter. And uh, we can see more number of students than going to Japan or more number of teachers coming to Bangladesh. Let our university be the first forerunner in introducing that kind of leadership. This is a request from my side to the high ambassador of Japan uh, getting you today. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. And second issue is with uh, Dr. Thakar Chaudhary. Sir, you quite often refer to the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. As you say that Athens was growing and rising, it caused fear and concern in Sparta. And that's why it caused a war which lasted almost for about 30 years, in fact, in which Socrates was also a participant. Now, my point is that now when Japan comes in, Japan is a development market, there are other actors also, like the United States of America, and particularly I'm interested in India. Will that be seen as a cause of concern by India? If that's so, will the Japanese intent of geoeconomic support will be then transformed or transited into geopolitical rivalry? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that brings up a question that was raised some time before because it was reported in the press I don't remember quoting whom, is Matarbari an Indo-Pacific port or not? So if it is an Indo-Pacific port, then I go back to your questions and those connotations come in. So I think our panelists can answer that. Zaid, you have the floor. So thank you very much, sir. It's, it's always very illuminating to be present in any of the BIPS program. Uh, uh, I am uh, Dr. Zahid Khan. I, uh, I currently, my current affiliation is American International University, Bangladesh. Uh, so as a reader of politics and international relations, and given the topic is about South Asia, uh, I will uh, approach the issue from a, a different angle and uh, some kind of evidence that I would like to put forward apart from uh, the narratives and statements. So I find there are particular uh, discordant actions in Japan uh, uh, Japan's discordant actions, particularly when it tells, uh, as some of the speaker has told, that it, it sort of imbues some sort of normative primacy of promoting democracy, anchoring its strategy on democracy, human rights, and also development. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to the uh, evidences uh, concretely, and particularly in, in, in the context of the Japan-Myanmar relationship and Japan's response in particularly in the case of Rohingya refugees. I cite you a few examples. Uh, in the, uh, Japan was very uh, forthright in condemning it when it, when it was uh, in the G7's meeting. But in the multilateral forum in the United Nations, it abstained from voting. Japan stopped its all kind of fine funding when there was a unrest uh, an attack on the Buddhist monks. A similar thing didn't happen when the persecution of uh, Rohingyas happened. And these are evidence because I, as a researcher, we, we take uh, data points of a state's behavior. Third, as of now, Japan stands as the second highest FDI and invest, investor in Myanmar. Uh, until recently, I think uh, just a couple of months before, uh, actually uh, last month in April, the UN uh, reporter, and uh, uh, Tim Andrews, who was visiting uh, Tokyo uh, in April this year, uh, he actually cited the, the, uh, the vigorous uh, sanctions that Japan has imposed on Ukraine. Uh, uh, it didn't apply that with similar uh, intensity uh, in case of Myanmar, 
although it talks about uh, democracy and human rights restorations uh, uh, in most of its statements. Now, this gives a researcher a, a very confusing state and probably a, a sort of an inference is drawn that when it comes to your geopolitical, geostrategic interest, your normative standings is dispensed and you are no more uh, holding that flag bearer, you're no more the flag bearer of promoting democracy and human rights, but you are a flag bearer of uh, economic development, which can, may or may not be at the expense of uh, uh, democracy suppression or human rights. So this is one uh, dilemma that the researchers face. So the question does arise, how far these assumptions are true, based on the evidence it seems to be true, and then how far do you think that any such development going forward does not sustain in the long run? Because if we have a Rohingya population, a large sum of it, uh, sort of uh, militarized or uh, trained with terrorism uh, infiltration, then all your investment both in Myanmar and Bangladesh stands at risk. So this kind of, so that's what I'm trying to come at that, do you consider these while setting up your strategies bottom line and how soon do you think you are dispensing that? And you'll no more probably get uh, uh, justice like uh, Justice Paul supporting and taking a, a independent stance on those kind of situations. Thank you. Thank you. Do I see any more hands? Okay, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I'll come to you, sir, after this. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Sarwar Chaudhary. I work for the Norwegian Embassy. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, my question to the uh, ambassador is that uh, uh, probably when we talk about South Asia and uh, and Japan now, uh, like other 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 speakers, uh, uh, I mean, discarding the Rohingya issue is uh, pretty difficult. I mean, it has affected South Asia, especially Bangladesh, in an immense way. Uh, so my question to the ambassador is that uh, we can understand the soft approach of Japan on uh, on diplomacy and other other things, and uh, we can also understand that probably Japan uh, uh, probably Japan is thinking about having some leverage on on some belligerent power in this region. For example, in Myanmar. So is there anything uh, in in Japanese foreign policy towards Myanmar so that you have some leverage on them, and then the leverage can be utilized for a constructive purpose. So is there anything like that? Just I want to hear it from the ambassador. And at the same time, I also want to uh, want to uh, uh, learn that whether you are aware of the Nippon Foundation's activities in Myanmar and especially in Rakhine. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, you have the floor. Microphone here, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, it is uh, interesting uh, in this uh, forum that uh, there is the, in the information, there is a plan to create a connectivity uh, between uh, Bangladesh and uh, India, especially uh, Northeast India. And uh, my question is uh, whether there is a similar uh, plan uh, to create a connectivity uh, between uh, Bangladesh and, uh, for example, Bhutan, and also uh, to create uh, uh, the connectivity uh, between uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar. It is uh, also to link uh, between uh, the uh, South region of Asia and Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I see anybody in the second row? So much has been talked about Matarbari, and I echo your sentiments that this is going to be a transformative mega project. Uh, but when I put on my environmentalist hat, in which field I work a lot, my question to the ambassador would be, how wise it is to construct a coal-fired station of this size? In this age, when Japan has almost stopped all coal-fired stations around the world, and it is a ma major power station. Are we doing the right approach environmentally? 
as a climate change affected country in constructing a large power plant which is coal fired. So that is my personal comment and my personal concern. So with that, we will now go back to our panelists. We'll first start with the ambassador. Thank you very much for the great interest to the Japanese diplomacy as a whole. Because uh, I listened and I uh, took note, but the, uh, uh, the, you, your questions relate to the whole diplomacy, <laughs> almost all, all our uh, guideline and our, our uh, fundamental uh, ways of thinking. And I'm not so sure whether I can uh, answer to uh, that uh, all the questions properly. Because uh, uh, whether normative or realistic approach is a uh, very, very fundamental issue uh, for the Japanese diplomacy. Uh, I try my best to answer uh, from my personal viewpoint. Uh, I'm not uh, the person uh, uh, I'm, uh, who is in charge of the each and every uh, policy ma making at this moment. I'm in charge of the Bangladesh-Japan relationship. And uh, much of the questions are uh, made uh, uh, outside of my, my capacity as a um, uh, Bangladesh ambassador. The, uh, uh, much of the question was raised uh, uh, related to Rohingya. And it, from my, my perspective and from my knowledge, from my view, I can answer some of the questions. But the, uh, uh, the way you raise the uh, normative versus realistic and so on is a uh, very, very fundamental issue. But uh, I try my best to uh, capture uh, as much uh, question as possible. And uh, But uh, if you think that uh, it's not uh, my my uh, Comments might might be covered by, uh, to individual questions. Uh, uh, please uh, let me know. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, in a broader term, I don't I don't uh, uh, broad, broader term. I would like to say uh, three points uh, about uh, the comments and uh, uh, the questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what is strategic strategic partnership? Uh, which was often uh, which was often uh, raised uh, by this kind of gathering, and I'm not so sure whether uh, today that was uh, uh, raised uh, directly or not. But the, uh, uh, what I would like to say, uh, uh, I, 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 I said uh, to the, that kind of question is that, that well, the in broader term, uh, the widening and deepening, and. Uh, uh, widening means, uh, as uh, was discussed, uh, we would like to enhance our bilateral relationship in the, in a balanced manner. You have mentioned that uh, the focus is on uh, this uh, uh, juncture, the the political strategic one, strategic relationship. But uh, if you uh, take a look at uh, the the joint statement, uh, it is also written that. Uh, uh, there are so many issues to be uh, tackled uh, between two countries in the economic uh, and economic cooperation issues. And uh, uh, today it was not uh, discussed, but the, uh, one of the uh, new focus of our uh, economic relationship is that now that uh, we are uh, thinking about the graduation of the LDC uh, in 2026, uh, we would like to uh, uh, enhance our efforts to have a mutual uh, uh, mutual relationship, not uh, on the ba basis of uh, re donor recipients, but uh, mutual equal basis, uh, with a view to uh, discussing negotiating the, uh, the economic partnership agreement, uh, uh, if possible, and uh, our wish is to conclude to uh, by two thousand twenty six, of course. Uh, before uh, the graduation of uh, the LDC, which is uh, fundamentally different from the uh, comprehensive partnership agreement we have uh, uh, we have agreed in 2014, and we can uh, 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 explain uh, uh, one by one. But the uh, uh, the the range of uh, uh, the cooperation or the range of issues we uh, we should move forward is uh, widening and. Uh, uh, many people have mentioned about 
the third pillar, people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, it is indeed true, and I have to admit that uh, compared with uh, the first and second pillar, uh, the third pillar is uh, relatively weak. And uh, uh, as an ambassador, I would like to uh, seek the way for uh, how we can enhance the uh, individual uh, 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 human contact, uh, person to person, and uh, university to university, students, students, uh, the business uh, uh, facilitation for uh, uh, the personal exchanges and so on. And uh, some people have mentioned about the, the the visa problem is a very big issue, which we which I uh, I noticed. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, I uh, uh, the thing that I uh, uh, began after uh, the summit meeting uh, in April is to uh, to identify where the issue is. Uh, the problem lies, and uh, how we can uh, uh, how we can deal with that uh, to talk with uh, our counterpart and so on. There are so many issues, and uh, I I do agree that the people to people exchange, the ex uh, uh, receiving the university students and the students who want to uh, study in the, in uh, Japan is one of the big challenges for the future uh, perspective. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, I uh, I don't. Uh, uh, many people are thinking that the uh, FOIP, the Free and Open in the Pacific initiative, uh, advocated by our government and followed by, or well, interestingly followed by, the United States or any other countries, uh, we are the first advocates, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, but yeah, many people have uh, tried to uh, try to uh, argue uh, that black and white, they yeah, are uh, FOIP versus uh, BI and so on. And uh, I'm always trying to uh, say that no, 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 it's that's uh, that, that's that kind of an, uh, that kind of issue. Uh, as, especially in Japan, we don't uh, we don't like Japan uh, black and white. <laughs> so that's our attitude uh, based upon our historic background and. Uh, our uh, colleague uh, uh, has mentioned about uh, the, the perspective of internal politics, uh, especially Prime Minister Kishida. The current Prime Minister Kishida is a liberal uh, uh, faction, and uh, uh, if you take a look at uh, the new FOIP the policy speech, uh, well, there are some elements of value, but uh, the, uh, the emphasis is uh, laid on the inclusiveness and more emphasis on the connectivity rather than the, uh, the, 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 uh, about the value or something like that. That means that we, uh, we, are, uh, we are not following and we are not completely changing the, uh, uh, our uh, way of thinking about the free and open in the Pacific, but the uh, nuance might change from time, uh, might vary. Uh, due to the international uh, uh, environment, uh, due to the accent of the policy makers and so on. I, I don't want to uh, interpret too much because I'm not the person uh, who uh, write the policy speech, who wrote the policy speech of um, uh, Prime Minister Kishida. But there are certain uh, a range of interpretation uh, about uh, the, our accent. And uh, uh, the, uh, and the police uh, take a look at in that way, and uh, the, that is uh, partly my, my answer to your question about <coughs> the normative approach versus the realistic approach. Well, uh, uh, Japan likes a pragmatic, realistic approach in in general, and uh, we differentiate the nuance. Uh, to uh, uh, of uh, our uh, normative uh, approach to uh, uh, to accommodate their uh, the relations and so on and uh, which is uh, a little bit different from uh, the approach of uh, other uh, Western countries and uh, uh, sometimes uh, Japanese uh, uh, diplomacy is criticized by that and sometimes uh, said that. Uh, it's very pragmatic, and uh, in the long run, uh, uh, as uh, some of uh, uh, the questioners have mentioned, uh, 
that might uh, play a le leverage uh, to change the attitude of uh, one country or other. Uh, sometimes that doesn't function. But yeah, uh, the nuance is different from one country to one country. And we talked. Uh, you talked about. Well, we talked about the global south. Well, uh, indeed, uh, we have been. Uh, we have invited uh, several countries uh, uh, from uh, so-called global south to the G7 summit meeting. But uh, we don't think that it's not. Uh, uh, it's not possible for us to uh, uh, ask those representative country to influence uh, each and every country. Of course, we invited India uh, to G7 summit, but uh, uh, the, the relationship between India and Bangladesh, or the relationship between India and Nepal, is uh, 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 different from country to country. And our approach is to uh, tackle those global issues and global south issues individually. The, uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister Kishida uh, visited uh, several African countries before the G7 summit meeting. Uh, that shows, from my perspective, that, uh, that that reflects our approach, or Mr. Kishida's approach. Uh, we should uh, talk and uh, discuss, uh, 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 deal with uh, the global South, uh, South issues, uh, not as a whole, but as an individual issue. So uh, that's our fundamental approach. And uh, I think uh, uh, when we talk about the South Asia, uh, the, the basic ideas remain the same. Uh, we, I, as an ambassador of Japan, would like to focus on uh, what uh, the, the fundamental uh, problem is, uh, that is uh, between Bangladesh and Japan. And my colleague in Nepal uh, uh, should identify, uh, is going to identify the bilateral issues. But the, uh, uh, you are right that new accent was made in the, uh, the Kishida speech uh, uh, on connectivity. Uh, we have mentioned about uh, the connectivity between the, uh, uh, the Matabari area and the northeast, uh, uh, northeast India. But uh, uh, it is a sort of a, uh, it, it, uh, we, we or the Kishida mentioned, uh, according to my interpretation, as an example. And uh, we know, and during the discussion uh, with the Honorable Prime Minister uh, in late April that in, when we talk about the connectivity and when we talk, when we think about South Asia, we, we should think about South Asia as a whole, not, uh, not uh, uh, aimed at one specific uh, connectivity. And, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, having said that, uh, uh, we are on the way to uh, think about new strategy about the connectivity in the real term in this region, South Asia. So, uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, your argument, your discussion about uh, well, how to what extent we should, uh, I or the government uh, of Japan is thinking about the relationship with Nepal or Bhutan is one uh, very important aspect. And uh, uh, how we can deal with the regional cooperation uh, 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 not through one uh, regional uh, organization like SARC, but yeah, uh, I found that BIMSTEC uh, is uh, the you the BIMSTEC has a uh, office in Bangladesh, and BIMSTEC has the uh, the uh, the connection with the uh, the uh, again uh, the uh, towards ASEAN, <coughs> and uh, I think uh, this might be one. Uh, uh, important element uh, to widen our perspective to uh, for the regional cooperation and uh, uh, but uh, having said this uh, this uh, this approach the, uh, uh, the how to uh, implement connectivity beyond border is uh, our new challenge and uh, we have to think about it oh, I should so thank you Professor. we are coming towards that so uh, the other two panelists, please be very brief in your comment. It's, it's I will respond to, uh, thank you, Chair. I will respond to two, uh, two of the uh, questioners who, uh, who uh, directed part of their questions to me, uh, starting with Mr. Uh, Najibur Rahman. 
Um, well, Rajiv, your point was, uh, I assume, uh, uh, you, you mentioned BBI and active knowledge marketing stack, but these are the uh, South Asia SAR. The reason why SAR or South Asia organization, of which SAR was the embodiment, the reason why SAR was created is some, it was motivated by what the Europeans called a, a fun, function in this. The idea was if you create uh, uh, connections across a broad spectrum of lower level activities, at higher levels, the intentions may be diffused. While the purpose, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the method was lower level activity, the, the purpose, the goal was high political, uh, perhaps lessening tensions between Pakistan and India, but it didn't work. So came these uh, other, uh, other smaller uh, uh, regional co cooperation, where the activities as well as the politics are of a low level. And therefore, it appears that it, in terms of what we are thinking, connectivity, etc., it will work, but it will not achieve the higher objective of uh, diffusing tensions within the broad region. Uh, uh, Vice Marshal, uh, uh, your your uh, mention uh, this thing about uh, Thucydides. Of course, the uh, what do you mean is the realists. Uh, there are there are the local uh, the contemporary variants of uh, Thucydidean politics, which is uh, represented in in, uh, uh, in China by uh, some of the professor Hugo, who's from the Peking University, and uh, 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 I assume that uh, Graham Ellison and, and John Yashai will be the most uh, prominent uh, advocates from the American side. Uh, both argue that no, war is not inevitable, war is avoidable if certain measures are taken. You see, what had happened was basically the idea is when there are sated powers, uh, there is an unsated power which wants to rise and it comes into conflict with the originally established sated power as did Germany when it wanted its base the sun. In, in the case of China and America, and that's what we are referring to, uh, to this Thucydides uh, uh, trap, uh, there is a danger. There is a danger because even if the conflict in Europe is being fought out uh, between uh, Russia and America, uh, in Ukraine, Ukraine is still a proxy war, and it is conceivable that the conflict will remain confined to tactical levels. However, however, is there is to be a war between. Uh, in America and China, that would be horrendous because uh, imagine a, 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 a taking down of a, of a, a carrier uh, uh, by, the, by the Chinese, uh, which will certainly lead to a nuclear reaction in the conflict between America and China. Therein lies the great danger in the Pacific, a danger which has not been uh, reflected in, in, in Europe so far. I mean, earlier on we spoke on this table about the American presence and British presence in, in Germany. The whole idea was if the Russian forces uh, move into Berlin, the automatically they will require uh, a nuclear reaction. And that danger has receded, but we see, I belong to a group called the APLM, the Grandiosity Coalition Pacific Leadership, it's a, a position on uh, nuclear uh, uh, issues. Uh, we see great danger that if this develops into war, this conflict, there is really uh, uh, we are facing a horrendous prognosis. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, already a lot of issues uh, have, have been discussed. Uh, so I just point out a couple of uh, issues that I also sort of uh, forgot to mention during my presentation. <coughs> One is Bangladesh uh, going middle class and their destination, as I also pointed out, and uh, well, um, how Japan can sort of tap into this uh, area, as well as how we can tap into. Japan's uh, sort of market uh, because we need uh, uh, to diversify our export destination, our export products, and this is one of the areas that we need to look into in bilateral relations. So when uh, IFA Economic Partnership Agreement will be signed, this is one of the issues that we need to carefully consider. Number two, um, one thing that I've mentioned a lot of times with my Japanese friends that uh, uh, disaster relief and the way Japan has sort of uh, uh, improved upon this because of their own need, and this is something we can learn um, disseminated in other countries. Uh, a, one, a small example would be whenever I would be taking an elevator, I would see a small crew 
Uh, it's like uh, a sort of a small tool made of stainless steel. And I used to think that this is for you know, a bit of older people to take rest while the elevator was going on. Then one day I inspected and I saw this is a this contain disaster relief materials. In case of any emergency, one can open it and find some of the necessary items for their survival. This is a very small initiative, but this is a life-saving initiative. So there are a lot of interesting tidbits that when we travel to a country we understand about the country we understand how they are preparing and these are some of the things that we can also learn and emulate uh, uh, given that uh, Bangladesh is also sitting on a fault line so another area is that I would uh, argue that we need to take a cautionary approach whenever we are talking about geopolitics international relations because you know um, when um, um, uh, Graham T. Allison is talking about Thucydides approach and other you, you please uh, note that these are experts who have been studying for 20 years, 30 years, and only then they are writing about this instead of making sweeping or flippant, com uh, flippant comments about, you know, what is going to happen in the region. So I believe that there has been much more sensitization on part of the, you know, media and other areas than, the, uh, than how policymakers see it. As His Excellency, Excellency has been pointing out that we are, look, I mean, Japan is looking at bilateral relations from, you know, the vantage point of two countries. Instead, there is a sensitivity in a number of areas that, um, as Sir said, that Indo-Pacific is a, uh, sorry, Matarbari is a Indo-Pacific port. So by doing all of this without having proper evidence, we are only sort of, uh, you know, trying to lit a fire where there is no fire. So this is something I believe that we need to be a bit responsible because um, this is, uh, we, we are living in a different era where, you know, in the tap of our uh, finger, we are getting a lot of information. And it is uh, an era famously called by a number of scholars, date of expertise. We do not know everything, but by virtue of Google, we all think we are half doctors, half engineers, half IR expert, half pol political science expert. And there is a huge danger to that. So we need to really be careful while we are making any comment or, or you know, making certain you know issues so i believe international relations and not because i, I study it i've been <coughs> studying for more than 30 years now i've been teaching for more than 24 years now and i still uh, hesitate to make comments because i know there's an implication of making any comment uh, and uh, you know sort of um, <coughs> argue any point so we need to be very careful uh, because we are sitting on a powder cage here in uh, in the pacific region history is back in in the pacific region and and this is the region once again, as a number of scholars has, scholars have said, uh, rise of the rest, Easternization of the world. All of these, um, you know, are happening right before our eyes. And just like previous two centuries, the initial phase of this century is also a bit unstable. So it is. Um, through the work of the all concerted parties, we can think about, you know, how the uh, world is going to look like 50 years down the road. Remember one of the very interesting comments made by Penny Wong, the foreign, current foreign minister of Australia. Uh, Penny Wong commented that the unipolar moment is over. We need to understand that this is a time of multipolarity. The number of players are making their, uh, you know, uh, entrance in international politics and they are doing it in a very novel manner. This is not something that we can compare with the previous century. So th there are a lot of branches that we need to really uh, look into before, you know, making certain uh, comments and understanding about uh, bilateral or multilateral relations. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I didn't, uh, I have dropped so many things, but uh, so many que uh, so many questions was made on the Rohingya issue, and I just want to say a few words. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, I can uh, say uh, from my perspective as an ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the question or the uh, several of, uh, comments were made uh, beyond my <laughs> capacity, and uh, uh, of that issue, I can uh, uh, I can say uh, uh, from my imagination, uh, from my viewpoint, uh, Rohingya issue is a very very important issue, not in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the bilateral relations, because uh, uh, if I talk with the, the current government, uh, Rohingya issue is indeed. Uh, burden for them because uh, they are uh, providing uh, the help 
uh, well, whether or not it is sufficient or not is uh, 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 debatable, but yeah, for uh, over one million uh, people in the camp. And uh, uh, they, uh, the, the government definitely uh, need uh, the support from the, all the donors and the relevant uh, countries. Uh, when, when this, this is one thing. And in, uh, in terms of uh, bilateral relations, uh, uh, it's a very important issue and uh, it is written in the joint declaration. Uh, and, uh, but uh, furthermore, uh, uh, when we take a look at the regional stability, uh, so yeah, uh, the the one over one million people are living for more than uh, six years uh, is a uh, uh, unstable factor for this region. And uh, uh, we should think about how, uh, in the long run, uh, uh, deal with this issue because of this uh, uh, to uh, the get gain the stability in this region. And uh, in this perspective, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, we, the, the government, uh, we, we, the embassy, uh, try to argue uh, to my headquarter that uh, you should think about not uh, this issue as a uh, pure humanitarian issue. You should not think about the bilateral issue uh, between the, uh, uh, the poor Bangladesh and Japan, but this is the, the, uh, the source for regional uh, instability. And that's my argument uh, towards uh, my headquarter. That's, uh, uh, that's the point that I would like to raise. And uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the, how the Japanese government can uh, influence uh, Myanmar, uh, well, that's my imagination. I think they are, uh, we have a very good contact with uh, the, uh, the Myanmar government for a long time, uh, but uh, I'm not so sure about to what extent we have a talking term with the current regime and uh, uh, to what extent uh, we have some leverage and uh, negotiation, I, I don't know. And uh, same is true for the, uh, the position on the UN and the resolutions and so on. Uh, it may influence uh, the attitude of uh, the Myanmar government. It might not, I'm not so sure. So, but the, uh, uh, the, our colleague in charge of the uh, the, the policy on uh, Myanmar uh, is uh, uh, trying their best to uh, gather every information and co uh, try to influence uh, to change the attitude of the, the Myanmar government. But uh, this is my uh, imagination. Thank you. And I'm happy to say that we are finishing right at 12, as stated in the program. And that is something we would like to honor very much. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for a very rich discussion. So there's no effort on my side to summarize it, except that I would request you to join me in thanking our panelists and the ambassador for their excellent comments. Thank you all very much. And may I now request you to join us for a cup of coffee outside, and please come and join our next roundtable next month. Thank you. <laughs>